Hey guys, Mr. Klein here talking about the Continental Drift Hypothesis. This is Chapter 7, Lesson 1 in your textbook. Uh, yes, I know, the last lesson we covered was Chapter 2, Lesson 2, uh, Structure the Earth, but hang with me here uh, as we go over this. Now, for centuries, uh, especially after the Western world had found the New World uh, with Christopher Columbus, and all that, uh, people began noticing things about the outlines of the continents. And in the 1850s, a gentleman by the name of Antonio Snyder Pellegrini was, he was a French uh, geologist writing a book, and he noticed, like people had done in centuries of the past, that uh, South America, its eastern coast, and the western coast of Africa seemed to fit together like a puzzle. And so, According to him, there at some time in the past that uh, South, Afri uh, South America and Africa had split off into their current locations. But, like everyone else before, he had no uh, possible explanation that he could come up with for that. Uh, however, the scientist who began thinking about this, his name was Alfred Wegener, okay? he was a German geologist and geographer. And he studied whether the continents move around or not. And here's a picture of the good man, uh, Herr Wegener, uh, Wegener rather. And uh, during the First World War, he wrote a book uh, after he had been wounded in combat and spent his spare time recovering, measuring weather reports in Belgium. He wrote a book called The Origin of the Continents and Oceans in 1915, which essentially stated that at one time, all the continents on Earth were together in one big lump and forces which he suggested had to do with the rotation of the earth spread them out over millions of years into their current location and that the continents were still moving the still moving today uh, it was not well read until after the war and Wegener's kept on pushing his theory and scientists rejected it uh, because there was no evidence for this movement they saw that South America and Africa fit together along with a couple other things that we'll talk about later, but they rejected it outright because there was not enough evidence. So the hypothesis kind of held on in the background while Wegener and other scientists kept on pushing it. See, this is the scientific theory in action. There wasn't enough evidence to prove it, so scientists rejected it until there was enough evidence. Now, Wegener uh, also did important things, like he was the first person to measure ice sheets in Greenland. In fact, that's where he passed away in 1930, uh, he w was going on an expedition out there and went to go meet with another group in the expedition. He got lost and died of exposure. Now, back to Wegener's uh, proposed hypothesis. He said that all continents were at one time part of a single continent of what we call Pangaea. Okay? Pangaea, over time, started breaking apart and the continents started moving to where they are now. Now, this continent that suggests that continents in constant motion on Earth's surface, this is the really important idea I want you guys to understand, is continental drift. Okay, the continents are drifting on top of the mantle. Okay, so Wegener essentially said at one time, hundreds of millions of years ago, all the continents were stuck together. And because of forces uh, moving the pieces of the Earth's crust around, the continents drifted off, and that is continental drift. Wegener observed the similarities of coastlines between continents that were separated by oceans. Not just there, but the Arabian Peninsula, Madagascar would fit into the eastern coast of Africa, uh, and Australia would also fit there too. And also North America and Europe would seem to fit together as well. And so the way he saw it, the continents that once formed Pangaea have coasts that fit together like pieces of a puzzle. Okay, so as Wegener saw it, that, like I just said with continental drift, that the continents were all together and over time they spread apart. But he would have to get enough evidence to convince scientists of that. So we're going to spend the rest of the uh, lesson talking about the scientific evidence that Wegener and his supporters put together throughout most of the 20th century. Now this theory of continental drift is only about 60 years old. Yeah, so it's such a major concept in the way we view the Earth and how much of it that affects our life when we talk about earthquakes and volcanoes and plate tectonics only came into being about 60 years ago, which 
a lot of that was actually based on something from our previous lesson on the Earth's surface. You remember the asthenosphere? That's the uh, plastic layer in the upper mantle. That was only confirmed in the early 1960s after seismic waves of the Great Chilean Earthquake, the, heavy, the largest and most powerful earthquake in the modern era. So this is the evidence that Wegener saw. As you can see, here's South America right here. Here's Africa, and here's Madagascar. And according to him, as you can see, the eastern coast of South America generally fits, and Madagascar generally fits right here. So for him, this was evidence of continental drift. Now, here's evidence of continents uh, that the continents move. First off, fossils of ancient plants and animals provide evidence for the continental drift. Uh, paleontologists, those are scientists who study uh, living things long ago, in other words, people who deal with dinosaurs and stuff like that, uh, found that remains of the same plants and animals were separated by different continents that are now separated by oceans. And a lot of this was found in South America, Africa, southern India, and Australia. So we'll keep on going back to these continents and we'll talking about that. Fossils of plants and animals that lived in wet and warm climates are in areas that now have, however, cold climates. And in fact, deposits of coal in Antarctica are evidence of continental drift. Scientists were doing uh, digs and going through the ice sheet in Antarctica where it was really shallow, and they found coal in their drilling. And if you remember when we were talking about uh, coal in terms of biochemical sedimentary rocks, I said it was formed by uh, decayed living things in swamps. Now, you might have marshy areas where it's cold, but temperatures needed to sustain the amount of growth of trees and that much plant life, you would have to be in a warm area. So, in other words, these fossilized plants in the coal deposits and the coal themselves show that Antarctica was once near the equator and had a much different climate than it does now. So let's go ahead and let's look at the evidence for this. As you can see, if we were to put together South America and Africa, as well as India, Madagascar, Antarctica, and Australia, this is what we would see. Uh, we would see a Triassic land reptile about nine feet long, Cyanonathus. Fossils are found across South America and into Africa. The freshwater reptile, Mesiosaurus, is found in Southern Africa and Southern South America. The late Triassic era, Land reptile, Lystrosaurus, is found throughout Africa, Madagascar. Note how far away Madagascar is from where we see it fitting. In India, and down even into Antarctica. And the biggest piece of this uh, was the Glossopteris. It's a fern, which means it's a fern. Uh, ferns are plants found in warm climates. It's found in, south, in this belt from South America, Africa, through Madagascar, India, throughout Antarctica, and even into Central Australia. So this showed evidence that the uh, plants moved over, over the millions and millions of years. So let's go on to the next set of evidence, which I showed you a little bit for a second. Wegener proposed that certain continents, including South America and Australia, were closer to the South Pole 250 year, million years ago. Wegener, Wegener rather, suggested that these continents were covered by a large ice sheet of glaciers much like in the Ice Age when we talk about geologic time, we'll get to that. Now, today, all of these continents except for one, Antarctica, are near the equator where the climate is warm enough to melt ice sheets. And so where's the evidence for that? Well, the evidence is in geology itself. If we look at this, common glacial grooves. If you were to believe the concept of Pangaea, that that one time there was this one giant continent where land spread apart over the millions of years, this is what you would see. Right here, all this area in white at one time, according to the continental drift theory, along with some uh, paleo-meteorological, pa rather paleoclimatological, that's old climate, uh, theories, that at one time, several hundred million years ago, all this area in white was covered in one ice sheet. And the ice spread out in the directions of the red arrows. And if we look at today's geology, if we look at the geological evidence, we see in southern South America, uh, rather southern and eastern South America, we see evidence of glaciers here and here, where it's way too warm for glaciers. Across Africa, from uh, east to west, we see glaciers moving, and even north, uh, south to north. And in India, we see south to north. In Australia, 
in a general southeast to northwest and in north southwest to northeast fashion. And the only way, only way this could happen would be if these continents were put together, which is what the uh, fossil record tended to show. So this is some pretty convincing evidence of that, that scientists began believing once they were looking at this. But it gets better. For example, like I just said, here's the glacial grooves, okay, that showed evidence. Wegener observed that were mountains and rocks on different continents that shared common origins, okay? And so here's some evidence in North America that proved this, if we were to go look at this. Uh, it's the Appalachian-Caledonian connection. Uh, in the eastern United States, you remember the Appalachian Mountains run essentially from Alabama all the way up into Canada. And a geologist did core samples and found rocks over millions and millions of years old that had a certain type. And at the same time, geologists in Great Britain over here and in Ireland and in Scotland over here, there's known as the Caledonian Mountains. They did drilling and core samples and they found at the same levels there were the exact same rocks that were the exact same ages old. So that showed evidence that at one time, Great Britain and North America were kind of in the same line, which if you're looking at this map at the top of the slide, it doesn't look anywhere near like that right now. And in addition, up in Norway right here, in the Scandinavian mountains, you have the exact same rocks that you find in the Caledonian mountains as well as the Appalachian mountains. So this shows us that if the continents were pieced together, like the proposed continent of Pangaea that Wegener talked about, there's a belt of mountains that stretches essentially from Alabama all the way to Norway, okay? So it went through the Appalachian Mountains, continued into Scotland through the uh, Caledonian Mountains, and ends in Norway with the Scandinavian Mountains. And at this time, evidence like this showed that globally, not just in the Southern Hemisphere, that the continents were together. So in addition to that, rocks, like I just said, rocks from the mountains prove that uh, that they had similar chemistry, geologic structure, and age. Now, like I just stated, you saw, saw in that picture, if you push North America and Europe together, their mountains would look like one long belt with the same rock types. Okay, so where did that leave us? Scientists still rejected the theory on this evidence because it's such a slow process. The reason why is they were unable to measure how fast the continents move. When we talk about plate tectonics, we're only talking about moving in the millimeters per year. Okay, so at the time, up until really the 1960s, we didn't have the computing power to measure that fine of measurement of movement of the ground. Okay, we could feel it with an earthquake, but the slow movement of the continents we could not measure. Wegener couldn't explain what forces caused the continents to move. In his book on the origin of continents and oceans, he said that it had something to do with the movement of the Earth, that the rotation of the Earth caused that. However, uh, scientists did calculations that proved that there was no way that that could happen. Now, additional scientific evidence to prove Wegener's hypothesis existed on the seafloor between the drifting continents. After World War II and into the 1960s, uh, scientists worldwide did a lot of exploration and we found out a lot about uh, the planet Earth that we did not know previously. Because we now had the technology, including things like sonar, which uses sound waves that bounce off the ocean floor. And even going up in the space with satellites, we could look down from above and we saw that all over the globe, there were lines that divided the Earth. And the seafloor showed spreading, that it was spreading apart over time when we were able to measure it. That, along with the rest of the evidence, uh, began to prove that the theory of Wegener's theory of continental drift was correct. And so evidence to prove continental drift was discussed decades after Wegener's draft. And it wasn't until the early 1960s that plate tectonics became known as the dominant theory of continental drift and things of that nature. So what does that mean, continental drift and plate tectonics? How does this, how did this look? Well, let's look at this flash video. Okay, this is how the Earth looks now. And all of these lines are all the plates, tectonic plates. Whenever we talk about tectonic plates, we'll discuss this in more detail. But let's go ahead and look at this. Around 200 million years ago, according to Wegener, okay, uh, all of planet Earth was in one giant continent called Pangaea. And if you notice, south uh, is further south, okay? And so if we turn on the animation, okay, around over the course of 50 million years ago, 
we started to see the continent separate. Now still, as you can see, Australia and there's uh, there is uh, Antarctica, there's India, there's the Arabian Peninsula, Africa, South America, North America, this looks like Greenland, and this is the giant continent of Asia, and this is Papua New Guinea. Okay, so it starts separating. And as time goes on over several million years, around 100 million years ago, now you're starting to see the continents. Okay, here's Europe, here's Asia, see the Arabian Peninsula, Africa, India, here's Madagascar starting to separate, Australia, Papua New Guinea, Antarctica, South America, and North America had detached from South America. So if we go forward in time another 50 million years, it's starting to look like how it is today. Uh, the islands in northern uh, northern North America are beginning to get near the surface. Here is a Greenland, all out on its lonesome. Europe and Asia, uh, the Arabian Peninsula in Turkey, Africa, India, Madagascar, Australia, Papua New Guinea, and Antarctica settled down in at this near the South Pole. And North America and South America are just about combined. And if we go forward to today, we see the world as it is now. Now, will the Arctic continent still moving? Yes. In fact, as we roll forward to finish this off 50 million years in the future, we'll see some additional changes. Oh, hit it too fast. Okay, here's it is in motion. 50 million years ago, present day, now. 50 million years into the future. Notice in gray, this is where the continents were. Antarctica is still sliding away. Here's North America. They're all moving away from each other. Okay, Europe's being pushed to the north. Uh, Greenland's starting to get smaller. Australia's kind of getting bigger as it gets close to the equator. It's getting spread out. Japan's moving away. Okay, India's getting pushed further and further into Asia. And the Arabian Peninsula's gotten bigger, and these islands have start, stopped moving. So, let's go ahead and let's answer these questions. Uh, by the end of this lesson, you would have been able to answer the following questions. What evidence supports continental drift? Okay, well, there's a lot of evidence, so let's go over it. First off, the eastern coast of South America and the western coast of Africa match up. They fit together like two pieces of a puzzle. In addition, coal in Antarctica, fossils and mountain ranges that span continents but are all separated by oceans suggest that at one time all of the continents were connected. So that's all of the evidence used to prove continental drift. Now, why did scientists question this? Well, the problem was Alfred Wegener was unable to explain the mechanics of how the continents move across Earth. And in the next lesson, we're going to go into how continental drift works and the forces that move the continents on Earth with plant tectonics. Know the lesson went a little bit long, but there was a lot of information, a lot of it really important going forward. Uh, for those of you in Louisiana, uh, continental drift and plate tectonics, this is one of those questions that you could probably see as an extended science task on the leap. Uh, so it'd be a really good idea to have all this evidence that you see on this slide together and be able to explain and also explain how it works out with the scientific method. The scientists rejected Wegener's continental drift hypothesis because he could not come up with an explanation for his observations. There was not enough evidence to prove it. Now, however, once there was evidence to prove Wegener's hypothesis, it was accepted by the scientific community. So there you go. Continental drift hypothesis. Uh, glad you were able to watch. As always, any questions, feel free to let me know. Post on YouTube, anything like that. Thanks for listening.